Good morning, everyone. A special welcome to our guest for today. Privileged to worship our Lord and our Savior with you on this Sunday. This Sunday is the day that we celebrate the transfiguration of our Lord, how Jesus shows us his glory. And it's important for us to remember who Jesus is, that he is truly the Son of God, um, especially as we make that journey to the cross during the season of Lent, where his glory seems to be hidden by, by uh, suffering and his death, but really is on full display on that cross because he secured our salvation. So we'll follow the order of service of morning prayer, and we begin with our opening hymn, hymn 543, O Jesus, King Most Wonderful. I invite the congregation to please stand. O oh Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O oh God. The glory of Christ is revealed. Please be seated, and we will continue with the psalm on the day. It's Psalm 2D, Great Are the Works of the Lord. It's printed out for you in your worship bulletins.
Our first lesson is taken from Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 through 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not realize that, his, that the skin of his face was shining because he had been speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, they were amazed that the skin of his face was shining, so they were afraid to come close to him. Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the rulers of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came close to him, and he gave them all the commands that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses was finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out again. Then he would come out and tell the people of Israel what he had been commanded. Whenever the people of Israel saw Moses' face, they would see that the skin of Moses' face was shining. Then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with the Lord again. The word of the Lord. Our second lesson is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look directly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, though it was fading, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be made more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation has glory, the ministry that brought righteousness has even more glory. In fact, in this case, what was glorious is no longer very glorious because of the greater glory of that which surpasses it. Indeed, if what is fading away was glorious, how much more glorious is that which is permanent? Therefore, since we have this kind of hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not continue to look at the end of the radiance as it was fading away. In spite of this, their minds were hardened. Yes, up to the present day, the same veil remains. When the Old Testament is read, it has not been removed because it is taken away only in Christ. Instead, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face are being transformed into his own image from one degree of glory to another. This too is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The word of the Lord. At this time, the men's choir will sing, I love to tell the story.
I invite the congregation to please stand out of respect for the words and works of Jesus found in the gospel for this morning. This morning's gospel is taken from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36, and serves as a basis for the sermon for this morning. About eight days after he said these words, Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothing became dazzling white. Just then, two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They appeared in glory and were talking about his departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were weighed down with sleep, but when they were but when they were completely awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with them. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not realize what he was saying. While he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. They were afraid as they went into the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, they found Jesus alone. They kept this secret and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. I invite the children to come up for the children's sermon this morning. We'll sing uh, the first three verses as the children come forward of our next hymn. Good morning, guys. Well, thanks for coming up today. I have a, a question for you. Okay, this is kind of obvious. What are these? Sunglasses, right? What do we use sunglasses for? Yeah, what do we use sunglasses for? Okay, so when it's really sunny outside um, and it's very hard for us to, to see, we put our sunglasses on and it kind of blocks the light so that we can see again, right? Yeah, um, it protects our eyes it's so that we can see when it's really sunny outside. Well, you know, these glasses, they, they, they kind of remind me a little bit about Jesus because Jesus is true God. And because he is true God, his glory is beyond our comprehension. We can't look at Jesus and live, right? Because he, he is true God. But Jesus did something. He became a man so that and hid his glory as he came here and, and lived among us. He didn't show everybody his, his glory, but, you know, in our lesson for today in the gospel, we hear how he gave us a glimpse of his glory we hear how he is, you know, true, reminding us that he's true God. It says, while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothing became dazzling white. This is called Jesus' transfiguration where he shows us that he really is God. Now, why do you think he wanted to give us a reminder that he was true God? Why do you think he did that? Yeah. 
okay, so that we can go to heaven. I think there's something else too. He died on the cross for us. After this moment in time where Jesus came down from the mountain, he made his way to the cross where his glory was kind of hard to, to see, kind of like wearing those, those sunglasses. Now, when we hear this section, the disciples, you know what? When they saw Jesus' glory, when they heard God the Father speak, do you remember what, what they, were they, do you think they were scared? Were they not afraid? What do you think? Yeah. They were frightened. Do you think you would be scared if you saw God's glory? Yeah. You don't think so? Yeah, kind of. Well, I think I would be. You know why? Because I'm a sinner. Because of my sin, you know, I don't deserve to be in God's presence. I don't deserve to stand and, and see his glory. But you know, kind of like putting on sunglasses, right? Jesus came and he veiled that glory. And he showed us the most glorious thing. He made his way to the cross. There he died for each of our sins. And then after that, he, what did he do? He rose from the dead, right, so that we can be with him forever in heaven. When that glory looks like it is veiled in Jesus' suffering and death, we really can, that's the moment where he shows us his greatest act of glory. Because he has secured for each and every one of you salvation in heaven. Where he says to each and every one of you, your sins are forgiven because of what I did. Where he says to each of you that you can now live with me. You can now be in my glory forever and ever. Amen. So when you look at sunglasses, remember what Jesus did. He, he hid his glory for a time. But then so that we can be with him forever in heaven and see that glory firsthand. Let's pray. You guys can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for revealing to us your word that you are true God as well as true man. Thank you for revealing your glory and your plan of salvation for us in your word. Amen. All right, you guys may go and have a seat, and we'll continue with the rest of the hymn. Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, today is the, the last Sunday in the church season called Epiphany. Probably wait till the screen is done. All right. Redo on the start of the sermon. Today is the last Sunday in the church season called Epiphany, where we celebrate the transfiguration of our Lord. Now, Epiphany is a, a Greek word that means to appear. Right? And, and salvation had to appear to, to us. And that salvation appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. And we need that salvation to appear to us. We need that salvation to be revealed to us. Why? Because God is truthfully beyond our understanding, because his ways are really contrary to the way mankind's natural thoughts are about him or mankind's natural assumptions are about him. And if we think about that, we, we know it's true. 
Have you ever wondered why God would willingly suffer and die for his creation? Have you ever wondered why God would create mankind in the first place if man is just going to fall into sin? Have you ever looked around the world and see all of the suffering that is in the world and just shout out to God and say, God, why don't you just show people your glory so that they will believe in you? Wouldn't that take care of all the problems? Maybe your shouts are on more of a personal level when someone near and dear to you is in sick or in pain or suffered and died. When the doctor tells you that you have cancer or everything that can go wrong does go wrong. Don't you sometimes you just want to shout out to the Lord, Lord, show me your glory and tell me it will be okay. Why is it that it seems like Jesus' glory is hidden? Wouldn't it be better if his glory was on full display Why is Jesus' glory hidden? Isn't that kind of what Peter thought, though, that it would be better if Jesus' glory was just out on display for everybody to see it? Because there you have it, Peter, James, and John, they were on the mountain, and when they were, when they were asleep, they woke up, and what did they see? They, they saw Jesus' glory, and the Bible describes the scene when he, Jesus, was praying. The appearance of his face changed. And his clothing became dazzling white. And when Peter and James woke up, they saw it. They saw his glory. How different is this scene than what transpired and took place eight days earlier? Well, wait. Good thing we have another projector on waiting in my office. We just need one more part to put it in so that we won't have these problems. So going back to it, how different was this scene on transfiguration than what took place eight days earlier? Peter gave this beautiful confession about who Jesus is when Jesus asked, who do you say I am? The Christ of God is what Peter exclaimed. But when Jesus told him what the Christ would do, how the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law, that he must be killed and raised on the third day. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we hear how Peter objected to Jesus' words, the Christ, the Messiah, to to suffer and die? Where's the glory in that? And people should be praising him and not shouting insults at him. And people should be serving Jesus, not, not crucifying him. Where is the glory in suffering and in dying? However, there on that, that mountain for a moment, it seemed like Jesus took Peter's advice. Jesus' glory was revealed to them Right? And so Peter says, Master, it's good. It's good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Uh, this vision right here, what was going on on that mountain, wasn't what Jesus presented eight days earlier. Peter didn't want Jesus to suffer. Peter didn't want Jesus to, to die. He wanted Jesus to to stay on that mountain and display his glory and just to bask in that that glory. Jesus, wouldn't it be better if you just stayed up here? Stayed up here with me? Wouldn't it be better if? Wouldn't it be better if? If we were on that mountaintop? Wouldn't it be better if we could see Jesus' glory like Peter and James and John did? Wouldn't it be better if he showed us his glory? But instead, that glory seems to be hidden. Hidden among the pain and sorrow of this world. Hidden by the suffering seen all around us and the suffering that goes on in our own lives. It's almost like we want to shout out at God and say, God, where is your glory? 
the age Christian whose spouse is being yelled at again, or the, sorry, the, sorry, the, abu- the verbally abused spouse is being yelled at again, shouts out to God in frustration, where is your glory? The, the aged Christian whose spouse recently died in the midst of tears, God, where is your glory and death? The Christian who was recently diagnosed with cancer, with fear and trembling, says to God, where is your glory? The Christian whose heart aches at having a family member that has fallen away from the faith, God, can't you just show them your, your glory so that they believe in you? Where is God's glory? Did he just leave it up there on that mountain? Did he just take it with him when he ascended into heaven? You know, it's almost like we we want to make that tent and go up on that mountain and have Jesus come there and tell Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But it's interesting in this section of Scripture, Luke adds a bit of commentary to it. And he said, he, Peter, did not realize what he was saying. When we shout out to God, do we too not realize what we're saying? That glory that Peter, James, and John saw on that mountaintop disappeared as quickly as it came. Jesus' appearance went back to being normal. His clothing was no longer dazzling white. And he made his way down the mountain. And he started making his way towards Jerusalem to do the thing that was the most unglorious, glorious thing that has ever been seen or done. He was betrayed. He was arrested. He was sentenced. He was beaten. He was ridiculed and mocked. And then he was nailed to a cross. Jesus, where is your glory now? Jesus, where is your glory among your suffering? It's like Jesus answers, my child, it was there on the cross. It had to be hidden so that you, a sinful human being, can see my glory. Instead of turning away in fear and trembling of judgment, you can stare and marvel at it. See the sins that I paid for. Hear me tell you that your sins are forgiven. Look at what I've secured for you. Eternal life. My child, you want to see my glory? It's found in, it's found in the words that I have given you. Look at my gospel. And hear my good news. In order for Jesus' glory to be put on full display, it really needed to be hidden. Not so that he could win us the best possible life on this side of heaven. Not so that he can win us a life that was avoid, avoid, a life that avoided death. But so that he could win for us a life on that other side of death. If we want to see God's glory in the midst of pain and sorrow, loneliness, frustration, anger, where do we look? We look at the very words that Jesus gave to us. We look to his gospel. Now, when Peter was saying that he should build a tent for, for Jesus and, and, and Moses and Elijah, then it talks about how that, that cloud enveloped them. And when God the Father came, Luke says, they were afraid as they went into the cloud. And God spoke from the cloud and said, this, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. God the Father's encouragement, God the Father's command, listen to Jesus. When we want to stay on that mountain top, when we want Jesus' glory to be displayed in a different way, when we say to him, wouldn't it be better if, 
Isn't it like we're telling God, listen to me? Uh, a while ago, I was receiving counseling from uh, another pastor um, about how to handle a situation. And he did the classic thing that God has equipped you and he has equipped you and placed you exactly where you need to be to handle that, that situation. And knowing the individual, I, I sarcastically said, and half of it truthfully was just to see his expression. I said, well, God doesn't know what he's doing, right? But with all sarcasm, there's a little hint of truth, a little grain of truth. I knew that what I said was wrong, right? And yet that was kind of how I was feeling during the time. What was God thinking? Sometimes there is a grain which we wish God would do something different with which we, we think we know better than God. Instead of listening to what God says, oftentimes we find ourselves telling God what he should be doing. God's encouragement, God's command, listen to Jesus. And what do you hear when you do listen to him? We hear the gospel. And what do we see as we hear that gospel? We see Jesus' glory. It's interesting that when we look at our lesson, we see Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus, summarizing the, the law and the prophets, the Old Testament believers. And what was the topic of conversation? It was about Jesus' departure. Literally, it's his exodus. It was like they were serving as an encouragement for Jesus for what he was going to face and what he was going to endure in the upcoming days. That exodus that was going to take place wasn't from slavery and bondage in Egypt, but it was in Jerusalem by way of a cross, which freed us from the captivity of our sins and leads to heavenly glory. My precious family in Christ, when we want to see Jesus' glory, what do we need to do? We need to listen to him. Turn to the gospel and see the lengths that your Savior went to rescue you from sin and to lead you to eternal life. In the middle of the suffering that goes on in the world around us and in our own lives, remember that Jesus, remember Jesus went, what Jesus went through and his glory that seems at that time the most hidden but it was really most on display because that, my family, is what secured your salvation. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, your Lord and your Savior. Amen. We continue um, with the, we praise you, O oh God.
congregation may be seated. Um, a reminder um, in the back is, if you have an offering, it's in the back of church as you leave. At this time, I ask that you please sign the friendship register, pass it down um, the, the center aisles. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to get the words back on the screen. So if you need a bulletin, um, the ushers can walk and bring it, bring it to you. I invite the congregation to please stand for the Lord have mercy. It's also found on page 213 um, in, in your hymnals. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful and hear and be merciful and answer me. God, in the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah, and the voice that came from the bright cloud, you foreshadowed our adoption as your sons. In your mercy, make us co-heirs of glory with Jesus our King, and bring us at last to heaven through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now, O oh God, you have called your servants to the ventures of faith, of which we cannot see the ending. By paths yet untrodden, through perils unknown, give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then at this time, we pray on behalf of the, the believers in Ukraine. We pray. Enthroned in heaven and ruler of every nation on this earth, in your infinite mercy, we ask your favor upon Ukraine, a country now engulfed in war. Look in mercy on those immediately exposed to peril. Comfort the prisoners, relieve the sufferings of the wounded, and show mercy to the dying. Keep our brothers and sisters of, you, of the Ukrainian Lutheran Church close to you by the power of your word in these trials of life and death. In the midst of this conflict, grant that sin may be exposed and true repentance achieved by the power of your gospel, even in this dark time. Limit the reach of selfish ambition and thwart those who overlook the suffering of others. According to your good and gracious will, stop this war and rescue or and restore peace among the nations through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we continue by praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Congregation may be seated, and we continue with our closing hymn, 522, Beautiful Savior.
A couple of announcements uh, for this morning. Um, Lent is starting up this upcoming week, so Ash Wednesday is, well, on Wednesday. So um, note that on the calendar, too, uh, different Lent suppers. If you're willing to take some of those, you can um, read, read about that in the bulletin as um, well. We have an annual meeting um, scheduled for Sunday, March 6th at 1030 a.m. If anybody's interested in the youth rally, it's for um, children that are getting confirmed, so eighth, uh, finishing their eighth grade year um, through high school. Um, and then we have a couple call um, responses from call letters. Uh, the first one is from uh, Mrs. Van Houten. Dear members of Trinity, on Sunday, January 13th, the Holy Spirit led the voters of Crown of Life to extend me a call to serve as your seventh grade and science teacher. Over the past weeks, many people have reached out to share their thoughts and prayers regarding my two calls to continue serving God's ministry here at Trinity or at Crown of Life as their seventh grade and science teacher. I truly appreciate all of the thoughts and prayers for Trinity and Crown of Life. After many conversations with members of both congregation, personal reflection and prayer, I have decided to return the call to serve at Crown of Life and continuing, continue serving here at Trinity. I look forward to continuing to join with the saints of Trinity as we work to fulfill the advice given by Peter. Serve one another, each according to the gift he has received as good stewards of the many forms of God's grace. If anyone serve, let him do it as one serving with the strength of God. Excuse me. Let him do it as one serving with the strength of God supplies so that God may be glorified in every way through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and power forever and ever. Amen.
from 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Serving, serving flock and shepherd, uh, Su Susan Van Houten. So she'll continue her ministry here among us. And our next, uh, our, our next letter is from uh, Mr. Petey, P Peter Beagie. Dear Pastor Benz, Pastor Slaughter, and members of Trinity Lutheran Church, I would like to thank you for extending the call to me by your, to be your principal and seventh and eighth grade teacher. I have enjoyed learning about the blessing and challenges of your church and school and the area in which you serve. You definitely have some exciting ministry opportunities in your future. At the same time, it allowed me to evaluate my call at First German. I really enjoyed talking with your different staff members as they shared their joy for your ministry. What a blessing they are to you. And after prayerful deliberation, the Holy Spirit has led me to return the call to Trinity to serve as your school principal and teacher. I could definitely see how my gifts could be utilized in your ministry, but at the same time, they are still needed here in Manitowoc. I know that the Lord has great things in store for your congregation and school and will provide you with the perfect person for your needs. You will continue to be in my, my family's thoughts and prayers as you continue your work in Minnesota. In his service, Peter Beagie. So contacted the district president and he said he could get us a call list for um, next week as well for principal and seventh and eighth grade teacher. So for the annual meeting that's coming up next week, then we'll also piggyback that with a call meeting as well. God's richest blessings on the rest of your day and the rest of your week.